it's good to see you again this time for dinner at eight. Okay, let's get right into this discussion, Dinner at Eight, because this is a show that has been revived. It's been made into a movie, into an opera. People love it. It has stood the test of time. 90, not even written, was came out 90 years ago. Tell us a little bit about what Dinner at Eight centers around. Okay, so basically, it's about this woman, Millicent Jordan, who's planning a dinner party. And it's for all these, you know, people because there's this wealthy couple from England that are coming over and she wants, you know, her status to go up because she's inviting them to dinner. So she invites people that she knows. She invites people that her husband wants her to invite for business purposes. And, you know, and along the way, there's all sorts of complications. Now, the play is very episodic that it basically delves into the lives of all of these people but you don't really see them all together until the very end at the actual dinner party you have it's looking at all these characters and what they're doing leading up to the dinner party and the dinner party is the culmination of everything but it's really a look at all these people the different states their different lives the different classes that they're in it kind of allows the audience to compare social and economic classes Right. Open with the classes is the fact here it is it's 1931 mm-hmm. the depression mm-hmm. these people are all concerned about their social status but they could care less about what's going on in the world with other people it's a look at the the disassociation of those of those classes you know you have the the servants that are m- much more attuned to what is happening to you know the millers who are just looking to just to make nice and to make headlines and are, are completely removed from the suffering that is happening legitimately right next to them. So it is something that the it's audience very today similar can to what's going to. on in the world right now. I legitimately, I, yes, was ju- I was just about to say that it's not so different than what we see today with the classism and, and the different, the different ways that economy and uh, where, where people are economically and where they are based on, you know, their place in society how you can have two totally different lives and things happening, two different viewpoints of the world, just based on those things, how differently they can live. You know, this was written in the time that it takes place. So this was very much at the forefront of what uh, George and Edna were, were seeing, what they were viewing, what they were entrenched in. Do you think, because they they were both incredible at what they did in terms of telling stories, but they both started writing as as reporters do you think that their careers as reporters and being involved in in taking a look at society and politics and what was happening, do you think that that allowed them the eye, the view to write these stories for the rest of the for the rest of the world that maybe well, wasn't quite seeing it the way they were? Well, also, they were both part of what was known as the Algonquin Roundtable, who were all fairly radical for the time in their viewpoints on stuff. And the Ferber was very radical and she was a very big advocate for um, um, Jewish rights. Yes. Uh, she, would go, she would go and attack uh, anything with anti-Semitism. Uh, and both of them, you know, and she also, if you look at her career, I mean, I'll, I'll, you know, she wrote a bunch of plays, but she was actually probably more famous for her actual writing. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, several years right before this, she had written the novel A Showboat and it was made into a musical. Yes. Once again, she's talking, you know, civil rights. She's talking human rights. Yeah. And um, Kaufman, um, from the research I've read about him, um, he was very, you know, first of all, he was supposedly a big womanizer and he just and a lot of the stuff that comes out in this there are several characters who are womanizers in Mm -hmm. in this and um he only wrote i found it amazing that i read that he only wrote one play by himself yes and 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 also this i found even more amazing was that from 1921 through 1958, 
I don't know whether you saw, you've seen this. From that, though, for those 37 years, he either had a play that he wrote on Broadway or a play that, that he was directed for those 37 years. Yeah. It's an incredible career, an incredible. He also, he also won two Pulitzer. Record. Yeah. He, he won a Pulitzer for uh, Of the Ice Sing mm -hmm. that he wrote with Gershwin. And he also won a Pulitzer for uh, You Can't Take It With You. Yeah. These are two very talented writers. George and Edna were yeah. both incredibly talented on their own. What do you think made it so successful for them to write together? What do you think it was about the two of them working together that made the writing even more spectacular? Like that combination, clearly Dinner at Eight is something that resonates almost 100 years later. So the combination of those two is doubly potent with how talented they are solo. Yeah, but yeah, because... I mean, I think the only one he, uh, that he wrote by himself was Butter and Eggman. But once again, it's also a showbiz comedy mm -hmm. because they were both involved in sh show business. Hoffman, his longest partner was Moss Hart, and they were, a lot of their stuff dealt with, with show business. And, and Edna Ferber, because of, she was involved, not so much as him. Oh, connections at that point were through the round, you know, through the round table. Uh, they both had uh, very, you know, they were both part of the the New York social scene. Yeah, they both actually supposedly there were, you know, uh, I read something recently that she was even at a dinner party that somebody. You know, they were big going to dinner parties and stuff with all those people. Um, for some reason, uh, I know it, I read something that said, you know, and but it just because they were all involved in the Algonquin Roundtable doesn't mean they liked each other, all of them. Of it's course, a, yeah, just like any group that gets together, not everybody's gonna like each other. It's not always the case. And supposedly somebody had a dinner party that there was something going on that somebody said made some anti-Semitic remark, and she got up and laughed. She just got up and walked down. Well, she had been fighting with that her her whole life. I think this is what I think the combo of, of George and, and Edna seems to really meld is that they both have strong writing skills. Edna is morally like there, there's so much that she has to say in terms of uh, being a woman in society at that point, being a woman that wasn't married, that didn't have kids. You know, she was this strange. In fact, I read, yeah, and I read, I read this thing that it was, you know, it, they never even mentioned anything about sexuality with her because supposedly there wasn't any. And she had so much, she had so much battling against her anti-Semitism as well that you can see where the two of them working together, he brings a little bit of comedy and showboating and she brings that layer of, of critical thinking underneath, like looking at the different classes and looking at the way that, you know, women in society versus men. So it's, it's a great combination that clearly they had success. They wrote three things together. Um, Dinner at eight has, has had longevity. It has themes that still resonate today, which is insane that a hundred years later, we are still having a lot of the same issues in classism um, and in the way people treat each other in society. Dinner at eight is a show that the Heights has already put on. Now you're bringing it back. What, what made you want to bring Dinner at Eight back and do it again? And did you do you have a copy of that original show? Are you looking at it for notes? Are you taking inspiration from pre, it? That was yeah, pre-videotaping and everything because it was forty years ago, basically. They had videotape that, didn't they? They did, but nobody videotaped shows back then. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, one of the reason uh, there were. One of the reasons why I suggested it was because of the variety of ages, because of the number of points, because everything we've done so far this year, if you take the shows we did so far this year, uh, we did Casa Valentina, fairly new show. Nightwatch, older show, hardly ever done. Mm -hmm. Getting away with murder had all sorts of things going for it. The fact that it was Sondheim, and Sondheim's only non musical. Uh, Nell Dash, brand new. 
Um, what the butler saw. Clybourne, Clybourne Park, fairly new. What the butler saw. Very, you know, classic playwright from the 60s and 70s, Joe Orton. And now Sweat, which is a, a new play. Mm-hmm. Well, it pretty much, everything was answering what we felt people wanted to see. Newer stuff, stuff that isn't done that much. And actually, Dinner at Eight goes sort of back into like a tradition that we always had doing some sort of older show like this, usually. Mm -hmm. And also, up to this point, most of the shows weren't that big cast. And since we were only doing one musical this year, well, we wanted to give as many, I, you know, I personally felt, let's give as many people an opportunity to be in something. And especially since we have a lot of older, mature actors mm-hmm. in, our, our, in, our active, in our active membership, well, you know, a lot of stuff, there really wasn't that much for people to do this year or even audition for it. So mm. I said, this show has a big cast. We ended and it sort of proved a point because we had 54 people audition. It's incredible. It's amazing. Yeah. And I mean, and pretty much where people would be fighting for roles it was like there were places to put everybody in their own little niche. It's beautiful. And, you know, so, you know, it, it's really nice. It's nice to see out of the 28 people in the cast, 21 are people who have done stuff at the theater before. That's some awesome. Of them, some of them have been along, around longer than me. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, it's just, it's it, the one the one nice thing about it is rehearsing it is because it's so episodic. These first two weeks of rehearsals have been very easy as far as you can rehearse people in small groups. You can rehearse four or five people at a you know at a time. It makes it easier on the actors. It's the ideal show for an actor to audition in this day and age and begin because they're not making the commitment of five nights a week in the beginning. I was going to ask you about that with a cast this big and and not only going through the audition process and how you, because it's a lot to wade through and a lot of auditions to see and wade through, but how do you break it up in rehearsing? Because it's sort of like you're really putting on a bunch of little mini plays. It's like one, one, one larger one. There's a one act, yeah. Yeah. And well, what we've got, you know, what, you know, what it is, is every little group, the family, where the, where the dinner party is, that's one group. Uh, there's, uh, the alcoholic actor and all his people. That's another group. The uh, the doctor and his wife, et cetera, is another group. The uh, Montana tycoon and his wife, that's another group. So you, we've been doing that so separate. So like people are coming to like one night, two weeks, nights a week rehearsal. And it makes it very easy. That's starting like next week, we start putting everybody together. Mm-hmm. And running things in order what we're also what we're also doing is because it's three acts and because it's multiple set changes uh i'm incorporating in between the set changes instead of just having the audience sit in blue lights for the set to change we're incorporating all music from the time period Hmm into and into little vignettes and in some cases little dance numbers all oh, stuff cute. The, yeah and so rather than having the audience sitting there going when is the set going to change they're watching yeah. something that's moving around oh i love that that's really nice because it's it's a you the audience that almost forgets that it's a break you know it, it's just yeah. sort of a nice bridge from one thing to the other that's yeah. a really really smart idea to do now this not only has Dinner at Eight been turned into a movie, into an opera, it has also been, what, revived three twice. times? Only twice. Twice, twice. 1966. Oh, yeah, 1966 and 2002 were the two revivals. Yeah, I saw the 2002 one. You um, th- okay, so that leads me to my next question. You know, if you've seen the movie and you've yeah. seen a revival, you obviously have seen other people's takes on this play. 
How do you put your own spin on it? Were there things that you saw in the movie that you liked that you want to incorporate in the revival that you liked that you want to incorporate? Or are you trying to be as different as possible so that it's it's completely well, fresh and new for people? First of all, first of all, there is a whole subplot in the play that's not in the movie. It's um, involving the servants. And I looked this up and I thought maybe it was because the production code wasn't in existence yet in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. But I think it was whatever they call the pre-production code. But I couldn't really find out that much information because it was probably something that would was considered inappropriate at the time to have on film. Mm. Okay. So there's a whole little thing in there. In fact, there's, you know, a couple of the characters aren't even in the movie. They took them out. Oh, that makes sense. They probably combined certain aspects of characters and made them into one or blended one no, character into one that existed. They just dropped this oh. whole thing, yeah. And it was, it was wow. mainly, mainly with the stuff with the servants. But the servants so then, were very predominant in this. So then what is it, I guess, you, so you saw the revival. Let's talk about then All right, looking the revival, at the 2000. The revival at Lincoln Center. In 2002. Gorgeous. Yeah, it was gorgeous. I mean, you know, they had sets coming out of the floor. It was just, you know, well, unless we were to, you know, dig a hole in the basement, you know, we wouldn't be able to do that. So anyway, um, to adapt it so that it works in our space, what I, you know, and in, in fact, a lot of the, some of the smaller scenes we're doing one on one side of the stage, one on the other. So it keeps mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think the whole thing I remember about it from seeing the revival was how, you know, how elegant it was. So whether it's, you know, in our school space or in Lincoln Center's big, you know, thousand seat theater, it's got to have that elegant, you know, that, that 1930s or deco attitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you're when you're putting a show like this together and there are those comparisons that people might have seen the movie and are comparing it to that or the revival and comparing it to that, does that concern you at all? Or are you like, I'm not worried about that because this show is its own version of it here. People will view it as its own thing. Like, are you not even bothered by the fact that people might have seen another version of the play or is that something that you take into consideration and, you, and you're trying to make your version of dinner at eight just a little bit different like have certain things stand out that maybe haven't been done before to to make it stand out from the other uh the other versions of the play that have been done if that were the case i don't think any of the shows of the heights players could be done because of the space we have to uh, constantly adapt on any That's show true. that we do i mean you know uh, 10 years ago when I did Chorus Line. It's, you know, <laughs> we had the mirrors, we had everything, but it was, you know, and some people even said, as a, you know, I found this an extreme compliment that they found that some shows, like even the Chorus Line, they felt that our production, because they were so close and so on top of everything, they understood the characters more. I think in some ways, we sort of have that advantage on people. That's amazing. Is there anything about the play that now being that it's almost a hundred years old, are there any moments or any parts of the play that you, that just translate in a different way? They're like, man, this is, this is going to be viewed or this is going to be interpreted so much differently than it was when it first came out just because of how society has changed and how phrasing and speaking and things have changed. Are there any elements of the show in which you think are going to have a different take now? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, the attitude of, you know, the attitude of towards, towards women is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure. I mean, there's points where it doesn't really get to, to physical, but there's, there's, a, there's, there's mental abuse on some of the characters. Um, Probably 
back when this was, uh, you know, originally done, they probably played stuff more on, you know, at back then abuse was okay. You know, and people didn't, you know, people didn't think anything of it. Whereas, you know, we're playing it a little bit, probably more subtle. Um, one thing I think in some case, in some places, probably we're playing things a lot more for the humor. Mm. Because, you know, what people would take seriously then, they don't take seriously now. Right. Do you think that the fact that those things have changed are are going to, I guess, because the audience is going to view them differently, do you think that it's going to change how the play is interpreted or how the audience responds to certain characters? Is there a concern that certain things that you want to hit a certain way might not resonate the way you want them to because of the fact that these these views and things have changed or do you feel like no the core ideas that you want to come across that you're that you know the show is putting out those haven't changed therefore the audience is still going to come away with the same feelings that you want them to personally my feeling on on this is that part of our mission as a theater is to educate and people you know and people should see what attitudes were like during a certain time period Mm. that were they right were they wrong and it's up for people to interpret i mean it's not i don't think it's a you know (laughs) i don't think it's a play that could be you know i mean they tried to do it and with the 80s, they tried to, they made it into a TV movie in the 80s. Right, yep. And if you watch it, it doesn't really work because it had to, it, it had to pretty much be done in the time period that it was written for the values and the whole mm. ad, attitude of the elegance and everything. Mm. That if you, uh, you know, if you update, uh, you know, a lot of times if you update something like this, it's not, it's just not going to work. Yeah. Yeah, I, I lose. You have to keep it. You have to keep it in the way that it was done, so that it, if you if you change it too much, it's a totally different. Yeah, I mean, it you know, totally different. Like, yeah. And, you know, and maybe part of it's me being a purist. I mean, I am not mm-hmm. a big fan of seeing Shakespeare done as Star Trek. I'm not, you know, I don't like this, that whole <laughs> that whole thing where they, you know, all of a sudden might be interesting. No, yeah, but no, no, trust me. <laughs> we, I mean, we've even had productions at the theater of Shakespeare that was like and what is going on here? <laughs> yeah. so now we've talked about how the classism and the elegance in this play is so important it's the setting and the costumes are probably their, their own character in a way so let's talk about the set and and the costumes how important it is for you to get it right especially with the constant set changes how do you find a balance of okay we need to make these sets easy to change in and out of but we still need it to set the tone that this is this is upper crest society all right what we're doing is it's gonna be a very simple set the pieces move around and become different things for different households and, and stuff for example uh, the bed for the boudoir, the it's all it's a, we're using a futon because we can collapse it, can throw covers over it, we can make it so everything transitions from one mm-hmm. place to another. Everything, pretty much, almost all the furniture is on stage the whole show. It just moves to different places for the different places, and we do you know like the sofa will be you know, covered with different throws to become different rooms. Um, it's going to be a very, you know, very simple stylized set because we, you know, if we went to, for realism, mm-hmm. we'd be there till three o'clock in the morning while people watch the set change. And uh, costume wise, we're going pretty much total time period. I mean, um, we're working, you know, a uh, lot of, you know, a lot of tuxes, a lot of beaded gowns, all that stuff. All the fancy, all the fancy stuff. For you, what is your what is your favorite part about this play? What part of this play always always hits you that that is maybe the most impactful emotionally for you? What what moment or what scene is it in this play? 
Um, that's hard to say without giving stuff away. Okay. I guess what is, what is the feeling then? Let's make it a little bit more broad. What does this play do to you emotionally? Why is it, why was it important for you to direct it? How does it affect you? What is the feeling that you get that you're left with after seeing this play? Right. First thing, why was it important for me to direct it? Uh, About, I guess, almost 10 years ago, I directed the Royal Family. Okay. And then about, let's see, it had to be about 40 years ago, close to, yeah, 40 years ago. I was, you know, I was, I was, I was teaching because I, you know, I taught for 37 years and the school I was teaching at the time, I directed stage door. So this is sort of like, this is sort of like my getting to do, like everybody always says they always want to do the Neil Simon, you know, the Eugene Ger- Jerome trilogy. Well, I've gotten to do the trilogy. So your trifecta. You've done the Kaufman Ferber trifecta. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The other thing is, you know, I've, done, I've also directed, I directed, I've, I've directed, I've been in, and I stage managed, I've stage managed for Kaufman's Man Who Came to Dinner, different places. And when the Heights did Showboat, I directed Showboat. So it's sort of like, mm-hmm. They both have a sort of special place for me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that makes, I love that. That makes so much sense. You're like, well, I have to, I have to be able to do this show. Like, I mean, it it feels like they're so tied into your, into your theatrical life that to not do this show doesn't make any sense. Well then, okay. Beyond that point, emotionally, what does this play do to you like what what, the first time you saw it what were your thoughts after you saw it for the first time what was the thing that hit you the most about it um the fact that everybody you know okay it may look like everybody has perfect lives but they really don't nobody does the fact that everybody's so status conscious Mm. and things like that you know when I first saw it, I forget when I first saw the movie, because I know it was before, it was before th- 2002, because that's when, you know, when I saw the, uh, the revival, but, mm-hmm. and the fact that, the fact that, once again, that every, you know, even the characters that appear in one scene are so well written, and I even see it with the people we had, you know, there were, you know, there's people in this cast who have done major, major roles and shows down at the theater, but they're willing to take on a one or two scene character role because it's so well done. And it gives, mm. you know, and, and it's actually great for a director when you've got people at this level that you can work with that, you know, it makes it easy. It makes it yeah. easy and fun. That's awesome. Oh, that's, I can't wait to see it. Dinner at eight at the Heights Players. You can go to heightsplayers.org for tickets. 